There's a hundred different ways to win. There's a hundred different ways to skin the cat. What's the best way to go? It's different for everybody. It's different for everybody. So when you go out and get advice and when you go out and get mentorship and when you read and when you listen to people like me, think about the lens at which that information is coming through. A quick thank you and follow up from me. Before we get started, something funny. This came up. Can you see that? This is a karaoke slip for Saturday at Mills Karaoke Bar in Athens. And it says, I found this in my pocket this morning. I put the same pair of pants on. It says, Dance with Somebody by Whitney Houston, Nick Huber. This was a ticket that I was about to turn in to go sing Whitney Houston on stage. And I'm really glad that I left the bar before I turned that in. But <clears throat> alas, it was a fun weekend. It was my uh, good friend's 30th birthday. We went out and tore the town up. No, we went to a little dive bar, drank Miller Lights and sang karaoke, but it was fun. Two things to talk about today. One is an observation and something that I want you to reflect on and adjust as needed. But I, I've noticed something about, actually, heck, a quick update from me. I haven't told you guys what I'm up to lately. It is just before Halloween in October 2021, and my entire life has changed. Obviously, you, you guys have, every now and then I give some updates on how I'm doing, what I'm up to. We have 31 employees now at our self-storage company. We have six people in the acquisitions team, another three people in the finance team. We got operations, we got collections, we got customer service. Um, our company is growing very fast. We have, let me pull up my portfolio. We'll have under over a million square feet of self-storage under ownership by the end of the year. It's mind blowing. I mean, you guys, I started this podcast when we had one self-storage facility, one, and I was still running a student storage business. I was still in warehouses. I was still very involved. Today we've deployed $36 million into self-storage. Um, my goal a year ago was to acquire $20 million in the next five years. We've done that in Six, the last six months, we've acquired $20 million worth of self-storage. The crazy thing is that we have another $28 million under contract to close by the end of the year. Um, we own 712,000 square feet with another 396,000 square feet of self-storage under contract across 16 properties. So we will very, very shortly, we will have 41 self-storage facilities and 1.1 million square feet of storage, 8,000 units. And we will have bought $64 million worth of storage that, in my opinion, obviously it's a market, in my opinion, it's worth about $100 million worth, uh, worth about $100 million. Things are getting crazy for me. We're learning a lot about delegation. We are hiring a ton of people from the Philippines through Support Shepherd. We've hired 16 employees now, um, supportshepherd.com, S-U-P-P-O-R-T-S-H-E-P-H-E-R-D. And... Um, they're changed. Those people are amazing, extremely competent, um, about, about $5 an hour to hire. Just very, very good. I mean, $5 an hour over there is an upper middle class wage. And so we get folks who worked for Visa, MasterCard. I mean, they're doing due diligence for us. They're doing um, underwriting, data entry, customer service. And I'm not talking about customer service like, hey, can I take a payment? I'm talking customer service like, hey, I'm at your storage facility. I need to find um, where to, you know, where do I find my unit? These folks from the Philippines, are they, they've they studied maps, they've watched videos of our facilities, they can show customers around, extremely helpful. Um, yeah, we got a couple people from Columbia working. We have one, in, one uh, three people in Chicago, one in Boston, one in Nashville, one in Augusta. We are all over the place, but I'm um, growing fast and it's great. I mean, I could not do it without the people who listen to this podcast because this was my first foray into building a personal brand. We now have 170,000 followers on Twitter. I've now met an insane amount of mentors and, and connected people who've helped me grow, a ton of partners who have invested into my self-storage deals. Um, we've raised $10 million in the last three months from out, outside investors that I've met through this podcast and through other places. Just mind-blowing, but I'm having a ton of fun, and here we are. So two observations today. I want you to take away some things, and I want you to actually think on this because it applies to everybody a lot differently. Number one, I want you to understand that there are two types of employees that work for you and frankly, two types of people in this world. 
Um, there are people who get stuff done. There are people who they'll take action. They'll do things. It doesn't need to be perfect. They'll get it done. And then there are thinkers and messengers. I call these people messengers. These are the people that instead of actually taking action on what needs to happen, they'll send an email to somebody else for them to do it. Instead of actually taking action on say reading a contract, they'll pass the contract on to somebody else to read. There are a ton of uncomfortable, crappy tasks that need to be completed in a small business. And it's so easy to pass on those tasks to somebody else, or frankly, just procrastinate them. So many people in management who work remotely on computers, they become messengers. They become people who talk about and think about and know about problems, but don't actually solve them. They pass information on and around about those problems. Many business leaders and the worst business owners and leaders are messengers. They simply, oh, I spotted something. I'm going to pass on information. I'm going to ask a question here. I'm going to pass it over to here. And yes, you have to play quarterback. There's a big difference though between delegating and becoming a messenger. Delegating is actually specifically giving somebody a task to do and seeing that it gets done the right way. Being a messenger is totally different. Being a messenger, you're simply pass information left, information right all over the place. So think about that. Are you a messenger in your business or are you a doer? Are your key people, your managers, are they messengers or are they doers? Hold them accountable, create doers, call them out for being a messenger. Obviously don't call them out in public or in front of anybody else, but that's all I had to say there. Now, something else. I've, re I've been reflecting a little bit on my real estate private equity career and frankly, my entrepreneurial journey. When Dan and I were in college, we had some mentors and they were at Cornell University in the entrepreneurship program and they were all into big idea entrepreneurship. We told them about our sweaty startup, our pickup and delivery storage business. And they said, ah, oh, yeah, Nick, that sounds good. But have you thought about this? Have you thought about raising money here? Have you thought about doing all these other things? We could have very easily got distracted, but frankly, we weren't that committed in our classes and we weren't that committed to our mentors and we were kind of stubborn. So we went our own way and we tried something new and it ended up working out really well for us. When we started our real estate private equity company. When we built that first self-storage facility back in 2000, we opened the doors in 2017, but we started planning in 2015. When we did that, we didn't get advice from anybody in the real estate world. And frankly, I'm glad we didn't because A, they would have maybe talked us out of it and B, they would have talked us into a structure that wasn't as good as the structure that we ended up inventing on our own that allowed us to own about 80% of that self storage facility, even though we only put up about half the cash. What does that mean? I mean, that's a loaded statement, right? I'm a very resourceful person. If there's something that needs to be done, I'm going to critically think and I'm going to make a decision and I'm going to act on the best way to do said thing. Now, if I don't have any idea how to do something and there's might be a better way that somebody else has, I'm going to ask a lot of questions and I'm going to get a lot of advice. But what you'll find is when you go to successful people and get advice, you'll find two things. A, not every successful person is smart. Frankly, there are a lot of idiots who are successful, who are really bad decision makers that got involved in good businesses and got wealthy, very wealthy. There's a lot of wealthy idiots. And number two, a successful person has a totally different risk appetite and they should have a totally different risk appetite than somebody like you or me or whoever is on the, in the early stages of wealth generation. Somebody who has already made a lot of money has a totally different way that they view the world than a person who has not yet made a lot of money. That's simple. It sounds silly, but think about this. I was 25 years old, about to build that first self storage facility. I didn't have a family. I didn't have, well, I had a, I was about to get married, but I didn't own a house. I didn't have any kids. I didn't have any debt. And we were about to take a massive risk a risk that I would probably advise myself not to take back then. I'd say, Nick, go buy an operational building instead of build one from the ground up. That's ridiculous. Why are you taking all that risk? Just do it. Well, that's because my risk appetite's a lot different now that I have something to lose. Now that I own a hundred million dollars worth of real estate and you know, we're doing really well. So I would have a totally different risk appetite as somebody just starting out. So I would advise them much differently than what works for me. There's nuance to all of this. There's a hundred different ways to win. So A, you're going to get a lot of bad advice from sharp people and B, almost all those smart, successful people that you go get advice from are in a different life stage than you. So unless they can do a really good job and when I, when I do my consulting, I really try to do a good job of putting myself in the situation of the person. When I'm in the situation of the person, I try to think about the fact that there's nuance. There's nuance. What's a smart move for me in my current life situation 
is much different than what is a smart move for somebody else in their current life situation. There's a hundred different ways to win. There's a hundred different ways to skin the cat. What's the best way to go? It's different for everybody. It's different for everybody. So when you go out and get advice and when you go out and get mentorship and when you read and when you listen to people like me, think about the lens at which that information is coming through. Think about the person in their life situation. Me, I think bigger now. It's also easy to get caught up in the weeds and think, oh my God, Nick, he's doing such big things. I want to, I want to be like Nick. And if I would have been following people like me back in 2011, when we first started buying a cargo van and driving around hauling boxes around, I would have given up and tried to shoot for the moon and it would have ruined everything. Starting really small, starting really low risk, starting really hot, you know, in a, in a bad business, starting in something that's labor intensive, trade your time for money. Doing that stuff early on is an incredible advantage in the big picture thing, but that might not be the advice you get from somebody who's made it big. There's also a lot of survivorship bias from people who have won and succeeded. Those people who have won and succeeded, they don't have a lot of uh, failures. They, maybe they won, maybe they beat the odds, maybe they got lucky. Definitely I did, I got lucky. What I did back in 2011 might not work now. There's a lot of competitors in that space. So just think about that. I mean, we've proven the model of self-storage managed remotely. We've proven that model. And there are still people with 30 plus years experience in the self-storage space that tell us our model is not the best way. Even though we're making better returns, we're growing faster, we're more profitable on a same store basis, on a per square foot basis. There are tons of people with 30 plus years experience that tell us that it can't be done. In some ways, and this goes back to the hiring. Are you going to hire somebody who has a ton of experience? Or are you going to hire somebody who's fresh and doesn't know what, how anything works? Oftentimes, I prefer lack of experience. I prefer to hire somebody who doesn't know how things work because you can come at it with a lens of innovation. I think experience, to a degree, hampers innovation because people are very bad at changing their mind. People like me, people who have won, people who are successful, they're very, very bad at changing their mind. They get set in their ways. They think they know everything. They're more likely to disregard information that disputes what they think. So as you go about getting advice and mentorship from all these different people, think about these things that I've mentioned. Think about the fact that there's nuance. Think about the fact that there's survivorship bias. Think about the fact that experience hampers innovation in a way because you get stuck in your ways. Think about all those things and don't be afraid to be a little bit different, right? For the most part, I poo-poo on radical innovation. I don't think taking huge gigantic leaps forward is the way to approach entrepreneurship. But here I am running the largest remotely managed self-storage portfolio in the country. We don't have an office. There's bigger operators than me who don't have a manager at every store, but they definitely have an office. They don't offshore employees and they do a lot of things old school. They still take cash. They still take check. We don't do any of that stuff. So coming from a guy who talks about good old fashioned sweaty entrepreneurship, I actually if you zoom out and think about what we are doing at Bolt Storage, it's actually pretty radical. It's actually pretty significant innovation. So yeah, think about it. Think about your risk, think about your nuance. And that's the thing about entrepreneurship. You can listen to these podcasts. You can listen to like people like me talk and there's just no substitute for getting out there and doing it. There's no substitute for trying. There's no substitute for learning as you go and making decisions as you go. Because there are a thousand factors that influence every single part of your business every single day and they change all the time. So what worked for me, what worked for Steve Jobs, what worked for Elon Musk, what worked for the guy down the street who you got advice from last week, it's going to be a little bit different in your situation. So take with this what you please and have a good day. This episode of Sweaty Startup is brought to you by supportshepherd.com. S-H-E-P-H-E. E -R -D. They are a full service headhunting agency in the Philippines to help you find talent for your service business at 20% of the cost of US equivalents. I've hired eight employees through Support Shepherd. I cannot speak highly enough about how it is revolutionizing my business. This company finds you candidates, they background check them, they do personality tests, they make sure they're a good fit based on your job description, they set up the interviews, and they even help you with the employment contract when you're ready to make the hire. I cannot recommend them enough. Check out supportshepherd.com to learn more.